Now, okay, we are now on air. Five, four, three, two, one. This is Literary Roadhouse, one short story, once a week. We're your hosts. I'm Maya. I'm Gerald. I'm Anais. And I'm Kenichi. On today's show, we're going to, going to be discussing the story of an hour by Kate Chopin. We're also going to be introducing ourselves and letting you know a little bit about our podcast. How is everybody doing today? Good. 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 Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Something bad just happened. This is literary roadhouse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> I told you guys. I told you the first episode. <laughs> it's like I can't yeah. get it to it's stop. Open <laughs> Wait, I'll just do it. <laughs> Uh, also. Oh crap! I can't get it to Wait, stop. Uh, I can't get it to stop. Okay. I think we should just rewind and. No, no. <laughs> oh no! It wasn't doing that a minute ago. Honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know. Okay, so audience, obviously this is the very first podcast, so of course something bad is going to happen. If everyone can just bear with me for a moment. Oh, 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 I know it's doing it. I know it's doing it. Oh, God. Shall I, shall I whistle to fit in? Or... <laughs> I mean, I have Okay. Heard <laughs> and now I can't hear anybody. Because we're not speaking, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I can't even see my own. Anymore. I got on. nada. <laughs> oh, I can, I can oh, see. No. Oh, there she is. Is that is that wind I'm hearing like from someone's? Shit! Shit! I think so. Shit. It's not. It's not <laughs> oh for me. God. I'll be right back. Yeah, there's... Oh, okay. I can't. Are we, are we still recording? Are we... Yeah, we're still live. No, yeah, we're still live. Oh, cool. I mean, <laughs> maybe while we wait for Maya to, to figure out her situation, we can talk to each other and introduce ourselves. Yeah, we can. Hey, okay. Anna. <laughs> yes, I have these great games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, this lovely. would be a great time for game number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, okay. I mean, I, I guess I can start for people. Okay, who... I have to oh, cut okay. out, and we're gonna have to start over. I've got nothing. Okay. I've got no sound, no nothing. Something bad happened. Okay. okay, so audience, obviously this is our first podcast. We'll be back in just a moment. Yeah, we can just. Okay. We're still here. Oh, there we go. We're still, we're still here and we're still live. Are we supposed to be here or are we supposed to go? I don't know. We can just let's, talk amongst ourselves. Let's, I don't know let's you see guys. what happens. Yeah. yeah. I don't know you two as well as I know Maya. So I guess I have some questions. <laughs> go on. <laughs> okay. I'll record it by the way. That's right. Actually, um, so Kenechi, I guess I know you slightly the least. Um, okay. Are you right now in Stockholm or are you in London? No, I'm in Lund in south of Sweden, which is like, um, if you have Sweden like this, like this, and like Stockholm's like here, Lund is mm -hmm. here, not here, and this is Denmark here. So I'm like here, like I'm about. Half an hour, 45 um, minutes from Copenhagen. I haven't yeah. been in London for about two weeks. Oh, okay. But, um, um, yeah. So I'm actually so an hour ahead of Gerald. So right now it's like, it's 9.05. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what have you, so what have you been, I guess, reading this week? Because you said you like a lot of magical realism. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had time to read this week. It's literally, this week and like the past couple of weeks, I've just been so busy. So it's like, literally, the only thing I've read is the short story, <laughs> and then my textbooks as well. Yeah, so but you can't really count that because that's not very entertaining macroeconomics. Yeah. Oh, really? 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> a little, little dry, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. a little a tiny bit. Tiny bit. But I, I did find something new to read. I was listening to this um, podcast, uh, Free Economics Radio. Mm -hmm. I was interviewing this guy. I think his name was Ted Kelly. He was like one of the founders of um, Wired Magazine. And like, um, he's like one of the founders of like, the internet and stuff like that. And he was talking about. Okay. Oh, he might as well. <laughs> hey, that's what happens when I unplug my microphone, uh, unplug my headphones. Okay, so I guess we need to start over. <laughs> okay, countdown. I told you guys, Murphy's Law, Murphy's Law, first podcast every time. Five, four, three, two, one. This is Literary Roadhouse, one short story, once a week. We're your hosts. I'm Maya. I'm Gerald. I'm Anais. And I'm Kenichi. And on today's show, we're going to be discussing the story of an hour by Kate Chapon. In addition, we're going to introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about our vision. How's everyone doing today? Good. 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 Better than you, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, be nice, be nice, be nice, yeah. be nice. Yeah. <laughs> so we've been planning this for the last month, and I'm pretty jazzed about it. Um, my original vision was to have a nice group where we can discuss short stories and read a diversity of literature that oftentimes gets overlooked and so our main goal is going to be picking random stories from all over the world and discussing them on air but since today is our first story we should probably tell you a little bit about ourselves so Anise, would you like to Hi. go first? Sure, um, so am I starting with sort of like the the life bio? No, so I, I'm <laughs> In Costa Rica right now, if you hear any wind, that's this windstorm going right now. Whenever there's a blizzard up north, we get wind down here. Um, and currently, I'm a writer and editor, a freelance editor, and um, I can't even say freelance writer because no one's paid me yet for my original oh, writing, but that's the goal. <laughs> it'll come. But they are, pay they are paying me for editing, so you know that's one foot in the door somewhere. How did you end and, up um, in Costa Rica? Uh, I came down here in 2010 for a job uh, in the microfinance industry, so I was working for a fund manager and a financial consultant for um, socioeconomic development projects, particularly in the finance section. Nothing to do with this. So I studied economics at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, got a job after I graduated, came down here in 2010, and I love the country more than the job, I guess feels a little ungrateful to say that, but um, but I'm here, and I love Costa Rica, and I like writing even more, and reading. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually how we met, because um, I posted on a private forum for writers looking for co-hosts that were very different from myself, because I didn't want to have co-hosts that were going to be like my friends who were exactly like me and had the same opinions, and I've been really, really glad that I found you, and I, so you're going to be an awesome partner. <laughs> Thanks. And actually, and I should that when I saw your forum post, normally if it had been someone else, I know this sounds like really brown nosy, but I wouldn't have been as interested, but on this um, website you can post your own writing and have someone else critique it, and Maya gave me the best critique on mine. I mean, I had a lot of great critiques, and hers was just exceptional. I was like, oh wait, this? She wants something? That oh, really man. does sound like brown nosing. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you anyway. <laughs> I'm following her. You didn't pay me to say that or not. She really did pay me. I'm yeah. on your payroll. <laughs> so how, how's that two cents going? <laughs> and, and our next host is Gerald. Gerald Hornsby, he is a writer as well. But you know what, Gerald? When I um, found you, I actually didn't know all that much about you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm I'm old, I'm old, I'm old. I'm retired. Um, retired engineer, so I, I spent a lot of time working in industry and with computers and that sort of stuff and uh, enjoyed that. But I've uh, been retired about six years now. Um, enjoying it lots and spending more time more time writing, which is good. Do you read I, a lot of short stories? I used to, but not not so much these days. Um, but I have read. I, I started off by trying to write uh, literary short fiction, so um, I read a lot of literary short stories, um, and uh, I still enjoy them. I st some people don't like them and, and just prefer novels, but I, I whenever I read them, I always enjoy them a lot. 
What do you think the difference is between reading a short story and reading a novel? Because I've heard that a lot. A lot of people don't start out with short stories or don't even consider starting to read short stories, and they kind of stumble into them. Um, I, I think people have a, a preconception about about short stories because if, if they only read novels, they they like the fact that the novel gives them space and time to to get into the characters and get into the plot and they don't think that short stories can do that but but it's surprising once you start reading short stories once you read good short stories there's a whole lot of stuff in there it's um i i find it fascinating yeah i found short stories purely on accident um whoa did everybody freeze but me or is, can you guys hear me no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I I found short stories completely on accident. I actually started writing short stories as a practice because I realized I didn't know how to edit my first attempt at writing a novel. And so I started reading short stories in order to give myself practice of revising and editing. And in the process, I completely fell in love with short stories. So that's how I found short stories. And um, I guess I'm like the newbie voice to short stories on this podcast because I think I've probably read the fewest of everybody. Hmm. And and our last host, our last co-host is Kanechi. I met you during NaNoWriMo because I was following your daily vlogs and I thought you had a really interesting, unique voice. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know that you live off and on between two different countries, and I find that really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I think it sounds a lot more interesting than it actually is. Everyone's always like, I'm from London, and then I'm, I'm studying for a master's degree in Sweden. So like, people will call me, and they haven't spoken to me in a long time, and they'll be like, oh, where are you? I'm just on, the, I'm on my way to the airport. Oh, you're flying again? I'm like, it's not a holiday. You know? It's like I actually have work to do. It's not just, I wish I was on holiday, you know? But I'm not, so. But uh, yeah, I'm here in Sweden, south of Sweden, Lund, to be precise. Um, kind of close to Denmark, close to Copenhagen. I've been here for just over a year. I'm studying for a master's degree in economics, which has nothing to do with writing. But that being said, I've always been like, I think when Maya invited me to come on this show, she asked me about like, my reading habits and stuff like that. And it was hard for me to think about, like, because I know people always talk about, oh, I read this book and it changed my life. And then, I started loving fiction, but for me it wasn't like that. For me it's kind of like from day one, from for as long as I can remember how to read and write, I've been reading. So it's like I may take breaks here and there, but it's not, there hasn't been one moment where I've started reading, you know. So for me it's just one of those things that's like a part of life. And then kind of like writing is like an extension of that as well. And generally I do how just did like... How you discover short stories? Like, again, it's, it's hard for me to say really. <laughs> I mean... I think I got into short stories from reading short stories written by authors that I'd read their longer works of fiction. So I think okay. probably the earliest, I read an anthology by um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I can't remember the name of it. It was one of his more recent ones, and I think that's probably like the first, like, I, can, I mean, obviously I read short stories before that, but that's probably like the first collection of short stories that I read. So, yeah, I, I've actually have a couple short story collections on my bookcase. I'm finding it's hard to get through all of them. I have to read one and then stop and then read something else and then read another short story. Just to read a whole collection from one author back to back is something that I still haven't been able to do. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's quite difficult to to you can't read short stories like one after the other after the other. Whoa, well, just a second. I think it's possible. Did you guys hear that? I heard it. Okay, I was just making sure it wasn't just me. Okay. You turned into an android for a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <It's a> line. <laughs> no, what were you going to say, Gerald? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was just saying, I think, I think reading one short story after another is quite difficult. I think, I think if they're good short stories, you need to sort of read it and, and digest it for a little bit. You, you can't... Um, I, and I, I think it's, it's the difference between genre fiction and literary fiction. I think there's... With, with genre fiction, you can, you can read a story, you can read a story. With literary fiction, they're so different, they're so precise, and so there's so much to them 
I don't know, I'm not explaining this very well, I don't think, but I think you can't you can't just skip one after the other. I think you have to read one and then go and read another one, you know, in a couple of days or something. Okay, well, I'm not going to let you walk into that landmine without um, getting a little <laughs> bit deeper into it. So uh -oh. does everyone have an idea of what the difference is between genre and literary? Because every time I ask somebody, what is literary fiction, they tell me something completely different. And so I'm curious, what do you guys think literary fiction is? Um, I think I like the definition that Gerald used in his recent blog post, which is really something that has some, it's a fiction that has something to say, or I think, I think the caveat here is something kind of new, or a new twist, or a new view to say on um, uh, what it is to be human, or what it is to live within a society. Because I think genre fiction does explore a lot of sort of universal themes. They'll explore love, they'll explore, you know, I hate just to be cliche about it, families. Um, but it's never, there's something, I don't want to use the word formulaic because I've seen a lot of really good genre fiction that within that formula, they can really surprise you. And they can throw a character at you that you did not expect. And there can be, you know, a plot development that you've never seen before. But it's not, you know, it's not your... It's not going to have that commentary on society the way that Orwell does, see, for example. See, like, I'm going to take point. your idea and I'm going to raise you a Juno Diaz because mm -hmm. I was listening to Juno Diaz and he's very specific on how he feels about genre fiction and the fact that, you know, when he was growing up as an immigrant kid, you know, Afro Afro Dominican, that he had a really hard time relating to literary fiction, but yet when he read genre fiction, they were able to attack ideas and experiences that were much more closely to his own, even though they may have been like weird aliens or whatever, that genre fiction has a specific place in being able to attack things that a lot of li times literary fiction can't do because it has to do it too much on the nose. So what do you say well, to that? You know, I think, <laughs> see, I think oh. sometimes when people say stuff like that, they're like, because, for example, you used aliens as sort of like uh, a dog whistle for genre, when that's not necessarily the case. There's, a, For example, World <laughs> of the World has a lot of aliens, but that's definitely literary. That's definitely a tag. You know, so I think sometimes people are, are, and I'm not saying you specifically or Juno Diaz specifically, but the way that people talk about literary fiction, it's almost like if it's whitewashing about people in a room staring at walls, that's literary, and if there's aliens and guns, that's genre, and I think... But that's I, not I, true, because, you know, one of my favorite stories growing up was On a Pale Horse by Pierce Anthony, and that had no aliens, and it was tacking a lot of religious, very deep themes, mm -hmm. and so to me, saying that literary fiction attacks, you know, deep questions of what it is to be human, you know, genre, oh, good genre, genre fiction does. But I think as soon as it does that, then you say it isn't genre fiction anymore. I think when people say, oh, that's pretty good for sci-fi, it's like, well, why, why are you just accepting that it is literary? You know, like, that's my counter-argument. Like, well, okay, then let's put it in literary. It's a classic now, even if it does have oh. aliens. <laughs> Tw 19 minutes into our first podcast. <laughs> first argument. Yeah. Yeah, I... So what do you think about literary versus genre? <laughs> Wow. Um, I was going to come from it from the angle of like um, the writer's perspective. I feel like genre is more, if I'm a writer and I decide, okay, this is how I pay my bills, this is how I'm going to make a living, and then I just want to write something to write something, I might write genre fiction, or I might have a specific story or narrative that I want to tell and I write genre fiction, whereas if I sit down and think, okay, I want to say something to people, I want to make a point, or I want to talk about current affairs, how can I weave this into the narrative of a story? And then to me, that's how I feel like literary fiction is slightly different because they don't come from, I feel like they don't start with a story. The story is like more of like the vehicle for communicating what they want to say, whereas with genre fiction, it's more about the story. That's interesting. How about you, so, Gerald? I know you wrote so, that amazing <laughs> post. By the way, it was really good. I actually learned a lot from reading that post. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> so, too. But for the audience that hasn't sat down and read that post, which is absolutely epic, yeah. Yeah. why don't you tell yeah, us it, a little bit? It's, it's, it's quite interesting that, that uh, Kenichi said that, you know, if you want to if you want to make money, then you write genre fiction, and and it's it's so so tempting to go, oi, 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 no, so you can't you can't make money after literary fiction. I didn't mean, I know, I didn't mean it like that. I mean, like, which is I mean, probably, in a sense, I mean, in a sense that um, actually a funny example that came to mind when I said that was um, what's this guy's name, 
the guy that wrote A Clockwork Orange, because oh. he wrote that book in three weeks, oh, yeah. and he wrote it because he just wanted to make some money. And to, to date, every interview he has, they ask about that story, and he hates it because he says, I just wrote this to make money. Stop asking me about the story. I've, I've written like a hundred other books, and you're not interested in any of them. But because, so. <laughs> <laughs> there is something to be said for writing so fast that your subconscious takes over. I don't know. For me, I'm really torn as far as what's literary fiction because here I am. I'm a writer. I would like to live as a writer someday, but statistically nobody makes money off of literary fiction. And so then I sit down I think, what is literary fiction? And I go into Costco and half of these stories that are quote unquote contemporary fiction, I would actually consider them literary fiction. And so I'm kind of prone to going with the definition of literary fiction as as fiction that doesn't fit any other like tropes, doesn't fit any other rules. It, it's it's different in some way but at the same time that doesn't seem to really encompass encompass it because there are literary fiction stories within all the genres especially like I don't read a lot of genre fiction but occasionally I read horror and I find horror tends to have a lot of literary elements and I'm not sure why in particular compared to some of the other genres I don't know what it is about that genre that tends to lend itself to that but there are so many good pieces of literary fiction in all the genres that I'm still in the air as far as what literary fiction is other than fiction that lasts more than you know one or two generations that people look back on and decide it was literary yeah I think that's that's fair enough and what one of the one of the, the the better definitions I found when I was looking around because it's it's always difficult and when you say you write literary fiction people say what's that and you go uh, it's just literary isn't it but um, one, one of the definitions was that uh, genre fiction is the sort of fiction you pick up at the supermarket checkout and genre fiction is the sort of fiction you discuss at college and, and it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's a bit crass and it's a bit, uh, but, but it's sort of, you know. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know what, I think at our one year anniversary after we've read 52 short literary fiction stories, we should come back to this topic and talk about how our own personal definitions of literary fiction has changed because it seems like it's something that is ever changing and doesn't it's, it seems like a moving target yeah and the only and the only thing I would sort of tack on to that question a year from now is to say does the label does, does the anxiety of trying to separate the definition of genre from literary does it even make sense because in a way we're just sort of playing the game of like the agenda setting literary community who says we're here to define it but at the end of the day fiction's fiction and I think um, it, it's worthy to say what's the difference just because that is something that exists in our vernacular and words that people use but at the same time for us personally it may not even matter a year from now after we've read all these stories yeah, very good point about, you know, we're, we're using the literary gatekeepers' definitions, but at the yeah, same time, those are the same gatekeepers that suddenly decide that, you know, some great short story from another country shouldn't be literary fiction. That's really ethnic fiction because it's different in some way. And, you know, we want to be careful of just accepting those, those ideas and those definitions at face value. Mm -hmm. For sure. Does anyone else have anything to say on the subject? We are looking at, we're coming close on the half hour mark, and I know we've got a special treat for our listeners. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say I, I agree with Anais because um, I'm kind of like hesitant when it comes to putting labels on boxes and putting things into boxes because I feel like some of the best works of art are those ones that don't fit into boxes. So you can't say, oh, it's this one thing or it's that. It's like it combines elements from different, you know, different genres, different, you know, I don't know what I'm, what I'm looking for, but it's those works of art that you can't just describe in a sentence, you know? Exactly. Exactly. I completely agree with you, Kenechi. Yeah, that's good. Okay, and so, you know what? We really considered how best to tackle this first episode since in normally we're going to be choosing a short story towards the end of our show and then everyone's going to go home and read it including our great audience and then we'll come back the following week and have a discussion about that story but since no one's really had time to read that story as far as our audience we decided to have a special treat for you we're going to read you the story we're going to read the story of an hour by Kate Chopin Gerald You're action in. Oh my god. What? Well. Story so of the, an Hour yeah. by Kate Chopin. 
read by Maya Good. Knowing that Miss Millard was afflicted with a heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. It was her sister Josephine who told her, in broken sentences, veiled hints that revealed in half-concealing. Her husband's friend Richards was there, too, near her. It was he who had been in the newspaper office when intelligence of the railroad disaster was received with Brantley Millard's name leading the list of killed. He had only taken the time to assure himself of its truth by a second telegram and hastened to forestall any less careful, less tender friend in bearing the sad message. She did not hear the story as many women have heard the same, with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once, with sudden, wild abandonment in her sister's arms. She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair, quite motionless, except when a sob came into her throat and shook her, as a child who has cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. She was young, with a fair, calm face, whose lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength. But now there was a dull stare in her eyes, whose gaze was fixed off yonder on one of those patches of blue sky. It was not a glance of reflection, but rather indicated a suspension of intelligent thought. There was something coming to her, and she was waiting for it, fearfully. What was it? She did not know. It was too subtle and elusive to name, but she felt it creeping out of the sky, reaching toward her through the sounds, the scents, the color that filled the air. Now her bosom rose and fell tumultuously. She was beginning to recognize this thing that was approaching to possess her, and she was striving to beat it back with her will, as powerless as her two white slender hands would have been. When she abandoned herself, a little whispered word escaped her parted lips. She said it over and over under the breath, free, free, free. The vacant stare and the look of terror that had followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright. Her pulses beat fast and the coursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. She did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that beheld her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial. She knew that she would weep again when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that never looked save with love upon her, fixed and gray and dead. But she saw beyond that bitter moment a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely. And she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. There would be no one to live for during those coming years. She would live for herself. There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have a right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention or cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in a brief moment of illumination. And yet she had loved him sometimes. Often when she had not, what did it matter? What could love, the unsolved mystery, count for in the face of this possession of self-assertion which she suddenly recognized as the strongest impulse of her being? Free! Body and soul free, she kept whispering. Josephine was kneeling before the closed door with her lips to the keyhole, imploring for admission. Louise, open the door. I beg, open the door. You will make yourself ill. What are you doing, Louise? For heaven's sake, open the door. Go away. I am not making myself ill. No. She was drinking in the very elixir of life through that open window. Her fancy was running riot along those days ahead of her, spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday that she had thought with a shudder that life might be long. 
She arose at length and opened the door to her sister's importunities. There was a feverish triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. Richards stood waiting for them at the bottom. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brentley Mallard who entered, a little travel-stained, composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella. He had been far from the scene of the accident and did not even know that there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry, at Richard's quick motion to screen him from the view of his wife. When the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of the joy that kills. Action! No. <laughs> Very good reading. That was the first time Thank I heard you. the I'm actually a little embarrassed. Annie, so you're, yes. you picked this story. What was it about this story that that really like attracted you? Um, well, I think I think at the most basic level, everyone loves a good twist. So the twist at the end that, oh, her husband was alive all along, he came back, and that's when she dies, not when people thought she would. You know, that in itself has that, I really like that. But also, I like the way that the story kind of builds on itself throughout. So it, it kind of, it starts out, because, you know, so because it's, it's a not even a short story, it's like flash fiction, it's just, just over a thousand words, it doesn't really get into the marriage, but it doesn't have to, just by the way that Richards treats her and the sister, you know, she has the trappings of a kept Victorian woman, because this is from 1894, and it doesn't need to be said, it's hinted at expertly from the very beginning. And then, you know, she goes upstairs, and this ominous thing that's coming to her, it's from the spring, it's from new beginnings, it's from a blue sky, and it's from bird song. And I just think, I just think the choices throughout the piece are really, really smart. Um, and I like when she describes physically the joy and the relief she feels when she realizes she's free. That's an excellent example. She just really shows it to you without saying, oh, she was happy. Like, you feel it with her in a physiological <laughs> way, which I really enjoyed. And I just thought it was well done. Of course, I mean, she's <laughs> a renowned author, but yeah. Okay, so one of the things we want to do is really talk about the story on like a higher level, you know, before we start getting into the nitty gritty. How did everybody feel about this story? Like, my initial thoughts were, I found it interesting. I liked how sparse it was. I, I think it is one of the better examples of flash fiction. And I thought it was really interesting, given its age, how mm -hmm. modern it felt. It, and also, while it felt modern, like it has like that, I don't know, it has like that early century, like feminist feeling. It doesn't feel like it's from the late 1800s. It really feels like it's from the early, the early 1900s. But at the same time, it also put into stark contrast um, the difference in privilege between women at that time who were married and women who weren't and how marriage could be seen as a trap in a lot of ways compared to modern times and so I enjoyed the story I felt really emotional with her as I was reading it and then when I got to the end I was like ah oh, that sucks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is something I wasn't expecting it's like ah oh, man your husband's alive so that was like <laughs> my what initial oh, <laughs> the heart still beats <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, so for the two guys on our panel, how did you guys feel about this story about this woman that you know has this great husband that loves her, but you know she's so happy he's dead? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I liked, um, I, I liked the, sh the, the story. I, I, I enjoyed reading it. Um, I, yeah. Before we get sort of into the deep, I, I thought it ended too quickly. It's you know, husband came back and she died, and you just think, okay, it's just like bang. Uh, but then you know, it didn't really need anything more. Um, but all the way through, I think there were there were little sort of hints about how she she didn't want to f want to be a kept woman. She didn't want to be you know this little housewife. Um, and I and I thought one one bit where she, there's this said that the um, the chair looks out of the window, 
um, was, was by the window and I thought she looked out of the window and, and wonders about you know the, the life outside the house on, on you know several different levels so um, so that, yeah I, I, it was a good I think it was a very good especially for the time it, as, as Anise said it was it felt very modern and now everyone's staring at you Kenachi. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't actually know that it wasn't modern. I thought it was modern. Like when it said that he died, I thought it was like World War One or World War Two or something like that. So, <laughs> so it's only as you guys are saying this now, the story's making more sense to me because I read it and I was like, "Well, that's not very nice." <laughs> <What'd you think? laughs> <laughs> that's a guy. Like, <laughs> he's done nothing but love her, and she's like, "Oh, I'm happy he's dead." I'm like, "That's that's not very nice," you know what I mean? And then I was also thinking because, like, from a modern perspective, it's like marriage is a choice, you know. So, and we don't really have any background about um, that story. But I was thinking to myself, "Well, if she really felt like this, she should either shouldn't have married him, or she should have divorced him at some point." But obviously, these are modern issues that, you know, at that time, it's not as simple. But like reading it that way, my understanding of it was that the author of this story, that perhaps she was in a similar marriage and her husband didn't die, but this is kind of like her just imagining out loud for a moment kind of thing, what it would be like to be free. And then basically the death at the end was to me was basically her putting the death to those thoughts. So basically, okay, I've had my little, you know, five minute imagining that my husband's dead, but that's not really nice to imagine he's dead, so let me just no, put that to bed. Yeah, I one of the things that really struck me, let me find it. There was a line in particular that you know, at first I was like, wow, you know, she seems so happy that he's dead. And from a modern perspective, it does seem kind of mean. Um, but at the same time, I've read a lot of Virginia Woolf and I I got pretty quickly like where she was coming from. Where is that line? Where she's talking about oh, there it is. There would be no powerful bending hers in the blind persistence with which men and women believe they have the right to impose their will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention or a cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime. So when I read that, it really made me think about, okay, he's done nothing but love her, obviously, but that doesn't erase the fact that she doesn't have freedom. So for me, I didn't have as much of a, oh, this is this is not very nice, there must be something wrong with them kind of feeling. For me, the story was much less about the marriage and much more about the feeling of being trapped, whether or not what's trapping you is a positive thing or a negative thing, that feeling of being trapped and not having choices. And that's something, as a modern person, I can relate to, but in a very different way. Instead of feeling trapped by being married, I feel trapped by not being able to get married. Because nowadays in my generation and people that would want to marry someone of my demographic, it's not something that is really an option. Like, people just don't get married. And it's not something that I can, like, walk up to some guy and be like, hey, will you marry me? And no matter how long we've been dating, it just doesn't happen. And so there's still that same sense of lack of choice, but rather it's flipped as a complete opposite in my case. And I can look back at my life and see a lot of other instances where I have felt like I didn't have choices, whether it was because of a negative or a positive reason. And I can definitely identify that feeling of... It doesn't really matter why it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And I and I would just add to that that I, I she also does. I think the marriage is sort of very typical for the time, and I think a lot of modern relationships could see themselves in it because she doesn't describe the husband as hateful. In fact, she even says, you know, she knows that at the funeral when she sees his body in the casket, she is going to cry and feel real pain, and that she did love him sometimes. You know, and and that in uh, I think it's really complicated. Like I don't. I don't, it's very clear from the story, she didn't sit there fantasizing about her husband's death all the time. This wasn't like this aggressive antagonistic relationship. And then as soon as it actually happened though, she was surprised that yes, despite there is real grief and sorrow because she, does, she doesn't hate this man and she will mourn his loss, suddenly there's this new freedom that she didn't even know she wanted because it does come to her out of nowhere when she's sitting in that chair. And I think, I think that's really the key point here is... Um, yeah, because I don't think it is so much about boo this man so much as it's 
there is some liberty for this woman to be single and why that is. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think for me, that's what made the story sad for me, though, because... I mean, I've always seen like marriage. I'm not married, well, not obviously, but I'm not married. <laughs> I've never, I've always seen marriage as um something that shouldn't make you feel that way. It should be the opposite. Like, and as some um, Maya, that bit you just read back, she didn't. Um, I find it interesting how she said men and women. So it's kind of like it's symmetrical. So we don't hear much about the husband, but he could have been feeling it a similar way because she simply said. It was just one way. It's, it's both ways. So I find that interesting because it's like she's feeling this way, but obviously they're not communicating about it, which to me I think would have been a good way to deal with the issue. But then obviously the story isn't about that. The story is more about the freedom. But I feel like this is what makes the story good because it's about the freedom, but it's also about the guilt that she feels for having that freedom. And I think the way that she wrote it illustrates that. That's probably why I can read it and have the reaction that I had, and then you can read it and have the reaction that you had as well. Yeah. You're saying you read guilt in it? Because I, I, there's this one line, which to me was one of my favorite lines the first time I read it through, and then the second time I read new ones. But when she says, she did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial. She's not even analyzing whether or not she should feel bad, which I thought was pretty bold. You know, I, I most yeah, of but be before in. that, she did try and push down the bubbling of feeling. Like, before she got yeah. to the point where she accepted That's the true. feelings as they came, she did actively try to tamp that down. Yeah. But once um, it was out, she was like, YOLO. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> she's going full throttle. <laughs> <laughs> there are sometimes you just gotta roll with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Gerald. Curious. <laughs> Tell us how we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, I don't think I don't think you are. I, I think at the time, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that many relationships were like that. The, the man went out, went out, did the work. Um, this guy seems to have done a lot of traveling. Um, and I think that that still happens today. That the man goes out to work. If he if he has to travel, he has to travel. That's that's just tough. And and the woman is left behind to to run the house and have children and and all that sort of stuff. And 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 I think some women can feel trapped and can feel that you know is this it for me? Is is you know I I is this the end of my life in effect? Because the the there's nothing else for me. There's nothing I can see. So that, that, and that's why I, I sort of I saw that she was once she thought he had died, then then she the whole sort of world started to open up for her. And it wasn't it, as somebody said, it wasn't immediate. It, it didn't sort of she's always oh, dead. Woohoo! Let's go out and have a drink. But she she did think about it, and and she sort of um, then started to. Uh, uh, I can't remember the right word, but yeah, she she, she started to sort of realise what it meant for her, and and it was once she realised that, then it was all positive. It was all you know a positive outcome. One thing that really struck me as you were talking, and and I'm thinking about a couple different threads that each of you have talked about. You know, the line "men and women" as controlling. Um, the husband walking into the house travel worn um, and she's the one that dies. One thing that really strikes me being from 1894 even in this moment of freedom she's not allowed to have true freedom. Who gets freedom at the end of the story? Her husband gets freedom because mm -hmm. she's the one that dies. He's obviously tired. He's probably not going to have to travel as much if he doesn't want to. He's always, yeah. you know, we like to think that men had all the freedom back then, but I don't think they did. Like, their mothers and their sisters kept them within their roles, and if they had to do something they hated in order to support the family, well, tough titties, you got to deal with it. And there goes our explicit rating. I knew yeah. that was going to happen. Maya, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we talked no, about this. For goodness <laughs> sake. Oh. Rated yeah. T for titties. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But you get what I'm saying? It's like a lot of these stories, it's always, you know, the women are trying to get the freedom, and in the end, they're the ones that end up without the freedom. And when I look at this from a modern 
-hmm. perspective. You know, how many feminist backlashes have there been? How many times have we heard the story that, you know, feminism was great and then all of a sudden the, they're, then like another generation is complaining about all these new rules that are imposed that they don't like and then the next generation it comes back and and there's always a sense that you know as far forward as you can move that you'll never have true freedom and as a minority I, I, I can see the exact same pattern it's like we want our freedom and then you know open up the news and Twitter every once in a while and yeah how free are we so you know that whole scene I mean, obviously, that theme may or may not have been present when the story was written, but that's no, a theme I, that I'm seeing now. I'm really, really excited that you said that, which is why I keep trying to, like, ee, I want to add this thing to build on that, because I think you're so right, and I think um, the author did this totally on purpose, because the last line is the doctor explaining to everyone on her behalf why she died and being totally wrong. Oh, she died because she was so happy to see him. Like, even in death, she doesn't even get her truth. <laughs> even in death, she was being explained to other people as woman and wife. She died because she was so happy her husband was alive. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> What better way to go than looking into the eyes of your, your beloved husband? Uh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Funny, you know, we laugh, but I think even in good, healthy marriages where people every day are choosing to stay in them, even in good marriages where it is an option for people to leave and to rewrite boundaries and to even in those even in those relationships, people may have thoughts like this, like this is good, but could I be doing something else if I wasn't in this? Not enough to get out of it because they're happy, but I think those... those but enough to cheat? I mean, look at the cheating statistics. <laughs> yeah, or not even, even... Even couples that don't, even the most vanilla couple that is legitimately, like, Partridge family-esque, you know, perfect... You always think, have those have moments. Those yeah, those moments are still going to creep in. Yeah, the, gra the grass is always greener on the other side, isn't it? And uh, It always looks easier. Someone else's marriage always looks smoother. They always they're look all, more well-off. <laughs> <laughs> the grass is always greener on the other side, and then you find it's astroturf. So, uh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> astroturf. I'm looking at the states. Do, do you call? Blow me a lung. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yes, it's quite interesting that that um, over here we had. Um, yeah, again, you wouldn't have realised this over there, but we we have um, we have a newspaper over here called the Sun, which has a page three, which has. Oh yes, women. I heard about this. And, and people were very uh, upset about losing the titties. Yeah, well, and, and there it goes again. Uh, can I mute Maya from here? There must be some control. <laughs> but um, but but it's 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 surprising that that a lot of men were saying, but the women have the freedom to do this and they can earn money, and the photographers are women. And, and totally missing the point that it's it's objectification of women, and it's always been objectification of women, and it still goes on. And and you you know women are are, are sort of you know they they um, uh, women are equal, but they're not quite equal. Men are a bit more equal than women. <laughs> and you know what? It's funny that you say that because okay, I have lived an alternative life. I have a lot of old friends that live an alternative life. And the, there is a constant feeling within, you know, as a woman, that you're being judged and there are rules that you have to live by, okay? Whether it is, you know, to be a good mother or to be a good wife or whether it is to uphold the feminist standard. And that is what, you know, when you talk about the page three or you talk about women that want to, you know, maybe be strippers or whatever and it's objectification of women. So in order to prevent objectification of women, you are tamping down the choices of women, which is in and of itself objectifying them because they're no longer fully human. So it's like this whole catch-22 of, you know, how much freedom do you ever get and at the end of the day you're still being spoken for. Yeah, and it's like we were saying earlier when we were talking about the, you know, the podcast ratings and and what what language should we use and and should we be self-censoring and should we censor these women and say no, you can't do that. You know, they should have the choice to do it, but 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 in doing so, then they they're perpetuating this objectification. It's a bit mm. heavy, isn't it? 
It is a bit heavy, and I yeah. so want to argue with you. <laughs> I'm ready to roll down, but you know what? We have like 10 minutes left to the podcast. Yeah. Right now is not the time for okay. us to full on brawl, Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because like, okay, when I was a kid, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, yeah, I was a stripper. Was I being objectified? No. Actually, the men in the club were the ones being objectified. People think that women are these innocent creatures. They think that they need to be protected and that, you know, they're the only ones that are being objectified. But in those situations, the women are controlling you. You're the one looking at page three, and they know you're going to look at page three, and they're going to make money off of you looking at page three. And so, you know, you go into strip joint, and you're, like, looking at these women, and you don't hear what they're saying about you behind your back that you don't hear how they're manipulating you with the things that they say. You don't hear any of that. And so in those situations, it's not just the women who are being objectified, it's the men too. And I think on a subconscious level, men know this, mm -hmm. but I don't think that they're willing to admit it up front. And so a lot of times when they say, we need to protect women from themselves, it comes from a place of fear and really wanting to protect themselves from women. How do you feel about that? Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think I agree with that. I. I think. I think there. There is. A, there is a. Yeah. <laughs> there's a danger with the objectification that it then. It then rolls on to to abuse. So you you have because, and and someone there was something on the internet. So it was obviously true. But someone was. Um, <laughs> someone list, <laughs> listed, listed these things. Uh, uh, instances where where women were were shouted at in the street and said, well, you know. Um, get your titties out and get on page three, that sort of thing. And why aren't you on page three and, and, and all this sort of stuff. And so, so in, in that respect, I think it's, it's legitimizing the objectification. But then there you are. You're putting the control of men's behavior on the backs of women. You're saying in order to prevent men from acting like asses, women have to control themselves. Ooh, no. Joel's advocate so hard. No. <laughs> we could, we could go on all night. Because like. If women didn't, weren't on page three, then men wouldn't act that way. We don't have page three. Men still act that way. <laughs> yeah, you, have, you have hooters, don't you? <laughs> huh? Has anyone ever yeah. been to hooters? Hooters don't even actually show them. It's just tight t-shirts. Like People think that we're so risque, and in some ways we are, but we are so flipping conservative over here. It's ridiculous in some ways. And you guys do a lot of things over there that we can't actually get away with. Meanwhile, we're the ones that get the flack for, you know, having crazy yeah. movies and sex and violence. Yeah, we have, we, have freedom in, we have freedom in Europe. You guys have your <laughs> sex and violence all over the place for everybody to see. We keep ours, like, in the movie theater and on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> But we're getting off the topic a little bit. With <laughs> well, I mean, NIH, you are free to tell us, get back into shape. Yeah. Guys, let's, let's talk about the objectification of Kate Chopin right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, let's go. I mean, have you seen the risque Wikipedia photo? The whole thing. Really? Okay, no. one second. No, no. <laughs> I almost fell for it. Dang you. <laughs> no. No, what's, what's her color like? <laughs> In another life, maybe. Actually, we don't know what she did behind closed doors. Anyway. Uh, well, humans are human from the beginning of time. Right. <laughs> Does anyone um, else have anything to say on this story before we start choosing next week's story? Can I give it Bradberries? I feel like I should start giving him Bradberries. Hmm. Yeah, give us some Bradberries. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start doing half Bradberries because I felt like five was too low, but six, that's for a special, that's for like knock it out of the park. So I'm going to give it five and a half Bradberries. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's some pretty high Bradberries. Wait, what is this out of? How many? Wait, these are our ratings based on no, any yeah, uses. <laughs> what okay, is the so maximum I, score that a story can get? Six. Five. No. Six. Five. Oh, she just five changed it. <laughs> I thought I had said six in the post. Well, the reason I, I, I'm giving it such a high score is actually because she did it in a thousand words and I was really impressed. Like that was just like craft. I'm like, you get you get half a point for craft. For telling me so much in so few words. <laughs> so, I think you need to practice writing some flash. It's really hard. Yeah. It's and yeah. I was really impressed. I'm like, look at that word choice. 
But yeah, so five and a half for Kraft. Or did you do five? Oh, somewhere in five there. and a half from Anais. How about yes. you, Gerald? How many Bradberries are you giving this? One. No, uh, I'll, I'll give it <laughs> <laughs> a grumpy one. No, um, I'll, I'll give it. Um, I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it four because because uh, because the ending. I, I I thought the ending was was just dropped and too quickly, but but still very good. Okay. Um, Connection. I have to make a confession. I really dislike scales because if I come out and I say, okay, I want to give this a four. <laughs> Then next week we do something else, and I say, "Oh, it's five. Well, so you think that story's better than this one?" And I was like, <laughs> "That's exactly what it means. We're gonna hold you to every single rating. <laughs> yes, we're gonna keep a chart in an Excel file just to make sure." <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like I can give it a rating, like I can give it four and a half, but then you I mean, know, you could do a you can do it, you know, whose line is it anyway style. You could be like, I give it a thousand Bradberries and it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I give it a thousand Bradberries. Hey, I already wrote down four and a half. Don't give him any crazy four ideas. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm going to side with Kenechi. Um, and, and not because of the ending, because I actually think, like, short stories, especially flash fiction and any story, I think the story should end when the story ends. And, and I liked how it prompted deep discussion. I liked how it was written. I really like the fact that even though it's a really old story, it has definitely withstood this, the time test. Um, but at the same time, it wasn't like the best story in the world to me. I've There are other stories I liked more. I don't know if that's because it was a little bit spoiled for me, but I can't like... Like if three is like a C, I want to give it like a B plus. So I'm going to go with four and a half. Okay. We have our Bradberries. Um, we'll try to get up on the site soon, a way for listeners to give us their Bradberries <laughs> so we can see what everybody else thinks of these stories as well. <laughs> and we will be holding every single commenter to their all of their ratings and say, hey, did you like this one more than the other one? <laughs> <laughs> we will come down. We will analyze every rating. This, this is some spreadsheet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And now we need to choose next week's story. So mm -hmm. for choosing next week's story, we're going to choose next week's story based on a simple game. Um, none of us have read these stories in advance, and we're going to pick them at random. The story mm -hmm. I chose was all of our stories are, are going to be available online to read. That said, there's no guarantee that they will continue to be online indefinitely. The story that I chose was The Cheater's Guide to Love by Juno Diaz. It is available on the, at The New Yorker. I chose that story because I really, really love his YouTube talks. I could watch that man talk like all day long, and I finally picked up like his novel, and I'm listening to it on Audible, and it is, it is good, but there are some things about it that like kind of irritate me, but then there's other things that are like genius, and I want to explore that more with his writing. So that's why I chose that story. Kenechi, what is the story that you want to choose? Um, the story that I chose is I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Ellison. And um, I've got a link for that, so I'll, I'll give you the link. But um, it's sci-fi, and I'm not really going to say much else about it, but I found it from... I used to go on TV tropes quite a lot, like a lot. Does it, anyone know what that is, TV tropes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, used to go a lot. I used to always keep seeing um, references to this short story. And so, I, I, okay, let me go and read the short story and find out what the references are about. And so I read it. It was quite interesting. So that's why I chose it. Okay. And Gerald? Well, I'm, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Ernest Hemingway fan. I love, love, love him to death. And so I've chosen a very, very short story, even shorter than this week's. So um, people can read it very quickly. It's called the old man, at, the old man at the bridge, um, and it's from uh, from his period when he was in the uh, Spanish Civil War, and and it's it's so few words, but it says such a lot, and uh, I I love it. That's it. And Anais, uh, the story that I chose is the start of the affair by Nuruddin Farah. He, um, I've never read anything by him, but I see his name everywhere lately. Uh, he's from Somalia, I believe, and I think this story takes place in South Africa, so I'm just kind of excited for a different setting, a different voice, so I just want to read his story. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
I think we just are. Did we decide to do rock paper scissors? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna do it a do it a four way. So whoever the two people that lose, and then like a runoff. Okay. Um, okay. Do you know how to play rock paper scissors, Kenechi? Yes, I don't. <laughs> I'm just checking. I don't know. That's like an American thing. <laughs> no, <we don't. laughs> Maybe you call it something else. Maybe you just spell it differently. I don't know. <laughs> Stone parchment and, and quill. Or okay. Well, I, can play it. I was just wondering how... How is it going to work? Like, We're yeah, probably going to have to do it in front of your camera. In front of the yeah. camera. Okay. So everybody get their hands up. <laughs> okay. Rochambeau. Wait, 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 wait. That didn't work. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay, now we need to start it over. I'm going to count to three. Then I'm going to say Rochambeau, and everybody throw up their signs. <laughs> okay. One... Two, three. Rochambeau. Okay. I cut paper, paper. Does that mean you win? I think you just won in one round, Maya. That's amazing. Yeah, okay. Did I really? You she did. Is one one everybody had paper? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody had Okay. So it looks like uh, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. Okay, so we're going to be reading The Cheater's Guide to Love by Juno Diaz by next week, and we're going to come back and have a discussion, and I think we need to figure out a different game mm. for next yeah. week. Yeah. No, I but think, I think, you know what I think we should do? We should have, like, a jar with everybody's name in them, and then we can pull a name, and whoever's name is the story for next week. That's not a game. I'll try to think of something. <laughs> uh, think it's not a game. Shut down. Play my <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want someone to leave in tears. I want to, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all of our live listeners for joining us for our very first pilot episode of the podcast. I know the beginning was kind of crazy, and it means a lot that you were with us. A cleaned up version of the podcast will be available on the website probably by this evening, and within a couple days, the podcast will start being streamed through iTunes. We'll also be working on getting it on some other um, on some other platforms. So if you have a platform that you, in particular, love to use, make sure you let us know. Um, does anyone else have anything to say before I close us out? No, subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Okay. For show notes and to join the discussion, visit literaryroadhouse.com. You will find all of our social media links on the site. While you're at it, like our Facebook page and please leave an iTunes review. It will be up on iTunes within the first couple days and it will help us a lot. Also, don't forget to tell your friends. Until next time, read a good read story. Read a good story. <laughs> we'll get it. We will get it. Yeah, <laughs> eventually. This time next